But now, because you can run this on Linux, you can also run these things inside the container. And that's what I'm going to show you how to do here in a second demo. So the workflow for this is pretty easy. You create a traditional .NET application just like you would you know, prior. Um, with .NET, you would do a .NET restore and then a .NET publish. So basically, restore restores all your dependencies. Um, it's like your gem or your pip install if you're used to working in a, a different language. Um, .NET Publish is going to be the kind of the same thing as hitting your build button inside of Visual Studio, right? It's going to generate all your DLLs, package them up, and stick them into that output port. Then you create a Docker file. So this is kind of the first we're seeing of a Docker file. And it's actually a really good example because Microsoft does a really good job at creating an easy to use uh, set of containers for you. So um, there are actually four pre-built images. The three here are kind of the important ones. If you are doing .NET development and wanting to use Docker inside of that uh, in some way, you would want to use the SDK version of the .NET um, Docker image. That's because they actually have a lot of extra stuff in there to kind of help you debug. You have a lot of extra dependencies that you don't necessarily need in a production environment, but it helps developers get things done quicker. So if you're going to develop inside of .NET and use Docker containers, use the SDK version. Don't do that to your systems when it comes time to do that in production. Make sure that you change your uh, Docker version in your from statement up here to runtime. What that does is it strips out a bunch of extra junk, and it requires that you compile your binaries and stick the compiled binaries inside the Docker container. The SDK version doesn't. So the SDK version, you can just dump your code up there, package it up into a Docker file, and run the thing. The uh, runtime version, not quite that way. So make sure that's a little caveat. I actually found that out when researching topics for this presentation. I'm not a .NET guy, so I'll just throw that one out there. You know, I'm more of a Python, Golang test guy, so um, this, was a, this was actually kind of an interesting struggle for me. <laughs> uh, the other thing to note is the nano server. If you are running these uh, containers on a Linux platform, use uh, one of the first two images. If you're running it on a Windows platform, use the nano server version. So if, depending on where you're running these, um, make sure you're using the appropriate container. Um, the next step, so that's basically your first line. Your first line says, what am I going to use as a base image? So in Nginx, they might have used Ubuntu as a base image. Um, it just kind of depends on what your needs are. The next three lines are straight copy and paste from Microsoft's help document. So that was great. Um, the first thing you do is you basically have to copy all your code to an app folder inside of your container. Um, so the first line sets that as your working directory where I should be copying things. The second line, or the third line, sorry, copies everything that you've already done in your .NET publish to the app folder, copies everything up. And then your entry point. So basically, your app, when you do a .NET publish, is going to create some DLL that's going to be used as the starting point for your application, right? You want to make sure this specific segment here is changed to the app that you're working with. So if you're compiling an app and it's called ABC, make sure that that says ABC, otherwise you're going to wonder why your container's not working. Then at the end of it, you build it and you run it, right? Easy. Fun thing, I, I, I absolutely hated history as a kid. Hated it. Even in high school. Until I learned about this thing. Anybody know what this thing is? Enigma? Enigma. Who said that? Ah, oh, there you go. Here, I'm a, I'm a Starbucks kid. Right? Um, yeah, this is an Enigma. Um, so what was it used for? German ciphers during World War II. There you go. So, um, uh, 
they would use this to kind of encrypt messages in some form. Basically, the way that it worked is you had a keyboard and you had a bunch of lights, all with just alphabets. You press a button on the keyboard, you had these three little rotors up at the top. Every time you would press a key, those rotors would rotate. So it kind of is an interesting uh, problem. How would you program this? And so I kind of did in that. Uh, um, basically, we can use this to encrypt and decrypt messages. Um, and, and one of the really cool things is it's reversed. So if you take the plain text and you put it through an enigma, you'll get a cipher text. If you reset everything back to the way it was at the beginning and put in the cipher text, you get the plain text. So it's kind of reciprocal in the way that the algorithm works. But it's really cool. Press a button, ro uh, dial rotates, and it shows you the light that it should be. You press another button, the dial's going to rotate, and it'll just keep moving through. So I've got an example of an encrypted message here. Um, basically, the first B, one, two, three, those things you can kind of ignore for right now. Um, really, and actually the three A's. Basically starting here uh, with my initials, because I was super, um, super curious as to see what would happen with that. Um, then all this gibberish behind it. So I absolutely hated Hello World programs, so I figured I'd try something a little bit different. So now the bigger part. And we'll see if this blows up as well. So this code is actually going to be available on GitHub for you guys um, with an interesting challenge after we get done with this demo. So basically the code relatively short. Um, again, I'm a not, not a .NET guy, so don't judge by my four .NET skills here. Um, 80 lines of code. And what this will do is produce an API that we can use to encrypt and decrypt messages using the same standards that they did with the Enigma machine. Um, you can see here, there were a couple important parts to this, and I won't bore everybody with the detail, but they would scramble up the rotors, um, you know, those little things that rotate for every key press. They would scramble those up, kind of make it a little bit more difficult to encrypt and de decrypt messages and kind of figure out all that good stuff. Um, and then there was also this thing called a reflector, which basically just one character in got a different character out. But the, the key with that is that if I would put in that second character, I would get the original character out. So that's the part that makes that um, interchangeable there. And again, not a dot that guy, so bear with me on that. So let's actually run this as just a regular dot that guy. So, dot net restore. Okay, all done. And dot net run. So, in my other tab here, I basically copied all the ciphertext. That's a little hard to see. But I copied everything from this slide over here. And I also set the initial rotor to this SMS. So now, we run it. And actually, the, the, the output looks a little weird, but that's how they did it back in World War II. They actually grouped everything in, everything in blocks of four just to make it a little bit harder to figure out what the plain text was. Um, so basically, that you know, encoded message says, hello, Canton software craftsmanship beta, right? So the cool thing is, is if you would put this in place of your message, you can see the message starts with uh, EDH, right? Uh, EBR, H, and then ends with MO. And if we put in the plain text, we get the second text back out. So you could keep swapping those all day long, and they'd be the same. So it's pretty cool. Um, so this is just a .NET app. So let's see how we get this to run inside of a container. So anybody familiar with 
a make file. And a lot of people basically uh, started back with a C and C++. And it's actually a really convenient way to run a bunch of build commands for any project anymore. Um, I happen to make one for our Docker container. Uh, I'll let you uh, kind of take this and, and analyze this on your own time. But the commands that you just saw me run with the Nginx container are all inside of here. But I put some variables. You're welcome to take this file and reuse it use it on your own projects for whatever you need. Um, but some of the highlights there are the fact that you can tag it, you can put a version number, you tell it what ports you want to expose. So it has some of this stuff built into you for you to make running Docker containers a little bit easier. Um, the way you would run this, uh, you can kind of see these sections here. Uh, we're going to look at the build, and we're going to look at the run command. So you can see what this is doing is first doing the .NET restore. It's already pulling down the Microsoft container from their repositories. It's, after it does that, it's going to add our code into that. Um, and it's actually done already. Uh, basically, you can see down that last line where it says entry point .NET ship it. Remember how I said you had to change that one little segment there? I just changed that to ship it because that's what So we can do make run, and now we're running this inside the Docker container. It's really that easy. I, I hate to oversimplify things too much, but it's really not that much more difficult to get .NET running on your own local system than it is to run inside the Docker container. In fact, a lot of people anymore when we talk in like more of the Go lane. Uh, or rather than installing Go on your own computer and trying to get dependencies installed uh, to build a binary file, what they'll actually do is build everything inside the Docker container. So when that Docker container spits out an executable, you don't have to worry about cleaning up your build environment, you don't have to worry about temporary files that I created or objects that I created. It's just going to dump you out an executable. So sometimes it's even more easy to get things to run inside of a Docker container system, especially when you've got 10 different versions of Node and Solid and all that good stuff, right? So questions on this little project. So now i got a little challenge for you guys. At the end of this presentation, I've got my GitHub repo, and you all can take a good laugh at my .NET code, it's fine. Um, check it out and implement the rest of the features of the enigmas. There are, uh, let's say, two dozen different types of enigmas, different types of rotor, different rotor configuration. This API only handles one of those configurations and only bits and pieces of it. Check it out. Make it work for all of those, just for fun. Submit a pull request and I'll merge your code back in and overwrite mine, so I don't have to look at it. So. Um, the other thing that you could do that would be interesting with this is try to figure out how to do it for a binary file. Back in World War II, you didn't really have to worry about that. But now, what would this kind of look like in a modern day architecture with uh, you know, binary files? It would be an interesting project. And I know we're getting kind of close here on time, so I didn't do a demo for this part. I figured I would just brush on the topic just so you guys have an idea of you know, if you hear these terms floating around, what's going on. This is all well and good to run Docker kind of on your local, spin up a container, play around with it, get rid of it. That doesn't necessarily work well in a production environment. You need multiple servers running multiple copies of your container. You're going to need load balancing. You're going to need service discovery. Uh, you need multiple registries to kind of um, organize all your images different versions. So there are a number of different um, ways to do this. We are going to use uh, Elastic Container Service with Amazon because we're uh, primarily based in Amazon's cloud. However, uh, Kubernetes is uh, made by Google and probably one of the more popular options. And if you need to stay uh, platform independent, 
use Kubernetes because it runs anywhere. So you don't get that vendor lock-in if you're worried about that with ECS. So that's up to you guys on what you want to run. There's also, I would say, a dozen different ways to run containers, but they're all different orchestration platforms. So it kind of plays out like this. Basically, you want a bunch of different servers. You want to tell it what containers to run, where you want them to run, and you want them all to kind of work seamlessly together. ECS kind of does that. Um, they use things called tasks, which are basically definitions for containers. And uh, Amazon will handle making sure that X number of those things stay up. Um, it will register those with the load balancer to make sure they're uh, available to other uh, containers as well. So they kind of handle this whole ecosystem. And the only thing we need running on the host operating system is the Docker engine, and then their ECS agent um, to register that instance with Amazon. And actually, that's a Docker thing. So really all you need is Docker, and then run your container on top of it. Kubernetes works in, I think, the exact same way. If anybody's familiar with it, they can probably tell you. Um, but it kind of works in the exact same way. The difference is they call them pods instead of tasks, and there's different different terminology, but they all kind of work the same way. Um, this is kind of the basics. <coughs> um, I thought this was kind of a good illustration to show you might have a number of different tasks running, but the placement of those, you don't worry about. You just say, I need this number of these instances running. It's going to handle that stuff for you. The other cool thing is if you're not happy where Amazon is placing instances for you, or Kubernetes for that matter, just write your own plugin to say where you want those things. For example, if you've got uh, like a couple of really beefy servers, lots of CPU, lots of RAM, you might want some of your nightly processing queues to run those servers rather than your little tiny ones. So you could specify, hey, this container needs to run on this big server, this other container needs to run on this small one. The other thing that's really important, if you guys want to adopt this as something that you use within your uh, company, make sure you automate it. I don't care how you automate things, just automate it. Um, for our example, we don't have time to set up a build server because we've got some deadlines. So we're making a set of command line utilities so that developers can easily push images up to Amazon and get them running on Amazon relatively quickly. Ideally, you would want to make sure that you've got a build server set up, you've got some sort of continuous 